So I'm just going to give you guys an introduction on uh, my study system, so I'm going to and coral reefs, and um, kind of how we've studied these things in the past, as well as uh, how I propose to study them currently using uh, uh, hydroacoustics. Uh, I'm going to go through my objectives of my project, kind of what I hope to get out of this, and then the current work that, uh, that I'm doing and what I still need to do. So the South Florida Coil Reef System spans the whole way from the Dry Tortugas, the whole way up to what's known as Port St. Lucie in Martin County. It's about 576 kilometers of reef track, uh, and it's the third largest barrier reef in the world. Um, it's incredibly important to the local economy, 71,000 jobs for southeastern Florida and $6.3 billion a year, and that's a low ball estimate. They tend to look at the lower ends of these things. So that's what we're doing. Ah, thank you very much. Yep, excellent. So let's go on a little trip here. Oh, there we go. I'm going to leave Cordoba for a second and head on just to show you kind of what I'm talking about and where we're going. Um, my area is right here in Miami Dade County. I'm interested in the reefs that exist there. Why did it do that? Sorry, guys. Uh, what is it doing? There we go. So, um, the reefs here have a pretty unique structure in comparison to a lot of reefs. In the north of Biscayne National Park, which is just north of Key Largo, uh, they classify the reefs into five different categories. These are uh, the ridge shallow, this is the green area you see here, colonized pavement shallow, all this light blue, uh, linear inner, the red, middle, orange, and the outer, which is this thin strip of yellow on the outside. Uh, the first two types of reef, the ridge shallow and colonized pavement, really are um, intermittently covered in sediments, and they don't really hold a lot of actual uh, coral colonies and because of that, they don't really support a lot of fish either. So for my purposes, I'm really only interested in the, the linear uh, reef structures. So to give you an idea, this is what a, an echo sounding going from near shore out to the, the easternmost extent of the reef. And you can see kind of where the reef crests come up from the bottom. Uh, so this is depth. So we're inner, the inner reef is around 3 to 5 on average, middle 6 to 8, and outer uh, slightly deeper. And this is variable as you go uh, north to south along the gradient of the coast. So the problem with these reefs is that they're located adjacent to uh, just an extraordinary amount of buildup. So something we're not really used to, I guess, up here in Cordova. This runs the whole way up this 576 kilometer stretch of reef, just along pretty much the entire stretch. And so along with this urbanization, you get a huge ton of uh, fishing pressure. Again, probably not something as comparable to what you guys see up here, but uh, there's 465,000 pounds commercially, and then over 18 million recreational trips, so people that just hop on their personal boats and go out and fish. Um, and the problem with that is that it, this is only getting worse. So this is a, a graph showing the number of registered recreational vehicles over the past 40 or so years, and you can see that it's skyrocketing and it's still going up. And so this isn't a problem that's getting any better or going away, um, it's getting worse. On top of that, you also have um, this associated anthropogenic inputs you know, um, with this urbanization, one of those being the sewage outfalls. It is exactly what it sounds like. They run a pipe from the sewage treatment plant the whole way out past the reefs and dump this secondarily treated sewage water directly into the ocean. Um, if you ever go to Miami, you realize when you're swimming off the coast, you're actually swimming in a lot of fecal coliform and uh, other sewage treated water. So, big problem for the reefs. And on top of that, you also have a bunch of rainwater runoff. So this is called Hullover Inlet, and it's where Biscayne Bay mixes with um, the, the ocean. And you can see, after a heavy rain, just all of this crap that gets you know, shuffled out onto the reef. And the first reef line runs right across here. So it is directly kind of affecting uh, the corals that exist there. So these are all problems. Now, we know pretty well the composition of the coral communities. So the actual coral colonies themselves and the species distributions and things like that. But what we don't know a lot about are the fish. So what we do know is fisheries dependent data. So basically the reports we get back from the, the commercial fishermen and the recreational fishermen. And all of those have some pretty depressing news. These black bars that you see here are species, just hogfish, um, yellowfin, um, so groupers, snappers. So these are all really commercially and recreationally important species. They're overfished. They're underneath this 30% spawning potential ratio, which is um, mandated as the, uh, the limit for overfishing. By, uh, by the US federal government. So a, a lot of these species that are incredibly important are, are overfished, and that's a problem. You know, despite this, we don't have a lot of fisheries independent data. So what we do have is centered a bit north of Miami, it's in Broward County, or in Fort Lauderdale, and um, south of that, the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Evaluation and Monitoring Project. But none of these really apply directly to Miami-Dade County, so there's, a, there's an absence of, of data on 
the communities there. So uh, this has been recognized as a problem. One of the biggest key coral players in the area, Dr. Gerald Alt, the University of Miami, has basically said we don't know enough about these reefs or their associated fish populations to make any kind of resource management decisions. So there's this void of information that we need to fill. Uh, so what they've been doing is expanding these, these fishery, fisheries independent designs uh, from the Florida Keys, usually uh, reef visual censuses, north. And uh, a reef visual census is where you have scuba divers that go up to the bottom and uh, basically count the fish and mark the species and numbers and things like that. So they're moving them from the Keys into this area, but it's a very slow process and it doesn't, doesn't happen quick enough. Plus, along with these, you have a, you have a number of different biases with visual censuses. Um, some things that come up with that. This would be a reef, this is the area you're surveying when you first get there. But very quickly, the fish realize you're there, and this is what it looks like. And so, you have this uh, avoidance problem. And in some cases, like with sharks and other organisms, you have an attraction problem. So there's all sorts of biases that are associated just with you being there. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, further, you also have the um, changing ability to detect fish. And so fish that are smaller than seven centimeters, so you're, you know, little guys, the ability to detect them as they get further away from the survey diver falls off very quickly. So only about 20% of the fish that actually exist are detectable only three meters away from the diver. And so these are fish that can hang on in the rocks and the crevices and things like that, and, and you can't really see them. On the opposite end, the bigger fish, you detect them farther away, and you don't really detect a lot of them. That's because, well, the fish see you uh, before you see them, or they sense you. And so these bigger fish are avoiding the divers, and you don't really see them except at you know, farther away distances. So there are biases associated with that. Uh, further, reef visual censuses are kind of spatially limited. Um, at best, visibility days, you have 60 foot of vis. Uh, how much can you really tell about a reef and its surrounding habitat by 60 feet of that reef in particular? You know, how representative is that of the rest of the reef? So uh, it's pretty spatially limited. What we, well, the other data we have is fisheries dependent. It has its own set of biases. So, you know, size selectivity, you know, the fishermen are only allowed to keep certain sizes of fish, so they're probably not, you know, representative results of the entire community as a whole. Uh, and, you know, you're killing the fish that you're, you're taking out in the first place. So it's removing the fish from the, the, the system that you're trying to describe them being in. So inherently a problem. So, again, this is a known issue. Uh, in the 2004 edition of Coral Reefs, uh, some very famous coral ecologists, Andrew Foy and Rigel, basically say that although worldwide there is this consensus that coral reefs and their communities are declining in health and in abundances, is that simply because they are declining or is it because we're only getting a very small snapshot of, of the, the areas? And are we seeing these declining populations because we can't accurately describe the entire ecosystem? So they, they mentioned that we require tools that allow coherent and speedy investigations of large areas of reef. Which is where my specialty comes in, uh, acoustic surveys. And acoustic surveys allow you to rapidly, non-invasively detect and map these large distributions of fish, and, you know, the biomass, uh, throughout large volumes of water. And so it would probably be useful to kind of understand a little bit about how acoustics work. And so uh, real quick, we're going to go through there. And if you guys have any questions as we're going through, please feel free to, to ask. Be happy to help. So an acoustic survey starts, actually, uh, uh, with a transducer. And a transducer is just the device at the bottom of the boat that emits what's known as a compression wave. And this compression wave is known as a ping. And you can think of it as a conical beam going out through the water column from the transducer. What inevitably happens is this beam encounters some sort of density difference, plankton uh, or you know, temperature change or a little fish. And when that happens, it changes the speed of the sonar, because sound moves at a measurable speed through water but it moves at a different speed through a fish than it does through the water. And you can actually measure these differences because when it encounters this density difference, an echo is formed. And this echo, it sends a small amount of energy back to the transducer. And we can actually measure the strength of this echo. It's called backscatter. And it's affected by a number of factors. Uh, temperature, salinity, uh, density, the, the frequency of the sonar, etc. We can quantify and calculate all of these factors. Now what happens is a sonar sends out a ping, usually um, uh, a couple times a second. And each ping is illustrated in the form of an echogram. And so you see here, each of these columns is a single ping, and it represents the energy that comes back from the, the sound wave that was initially sent into the water column. So let's take a look at one of these. This is an example of the third reef crest uh, from one of my surveys. And it might look like a bunch of gibberish, but I actually see some targets here, some fish. And so let's take a look at one of these a little bit closer. So here we see 
what's known as a single target. And it's encompassed within a single ping that comes down through here. And we can actually measure the strength of this return, of this backscatter, oops, sorry, as we you know, go through depth. So as you see, there's a very, very strong decibel return right around 20 meters. And this is associated with the bottom. That's, a, that's typical of a bottom response. Directly above that, around 18 meters, you see another hard response, not quite as hard. But this is a curve that's typical of a fish. So we can actually tell that this is um, some sort of fish. So, knowing that, I have a couple of objectives that's going to utilize these echograms in this backscatter uh, to kind of describe the fish populations there. So, because backscatter is approximately proportional to the biomass of targets in the water, we can answer some questions about distributions. So I want to compare the results of these traditional uh, reef visual censuses and the novel survey techniques in the form of acoustics. And I want to see if they're you know, supplemental or complementary to each other. Can we fill in the holes and the spaces that reef visual censuses can't reach with acoustics? And as a, as a byproduct, we'll also be collecting some pretty large data sets on the fit distribution of fish communities themselves. So we can actually look at reef characters and see if they can be used as a predictive factor to uh, explain why we're seeing fish. So to do that, I've broken up my study site into three strata. So uh, this Cane Bay campus is right here. And here's Hallover Inlet. So I wanted to encompass this inlet area where we remember seeing the, uh, the pollution that kind of flows out directly onto the reef. I want to know if that has any kind of structuring effect. And so one of my strata is centered on that. And then I also have a north and south strata uh, in comparison. For anybody interested, this is South Beach. It's insane. Don't ever go there. <laughs> so uh, each of these strata is broken up into six substrata. And each of these have three transects within it. And on any given survey day, I select one of these transects within each substrata to survey. And so, you know, this is a GPS track of one of my survey boats. We go out uh, and survey one of each of those on a, on a daily basis. And this is how we collect our acoustic data. Simultaneously, we also have a dive boat that have a couple of divers who volunteer for me, take a boat out. And this blue track is the dive boat. You can see that spatially, we overlap pretty well on our survey days. And this is to kind of minimize any kind of temporal effects in the, the differences of fish distributions. And so you can see here in this yellow, they, they survey once on the third reef, once on the second reef, and once on the first. And uh, usually this works pretty well, except you know, there's, there's hundreds of miles of coastline, and inevitably a boat decides to park right in the middle of my transect. So my divers, uh, despite my urging, decided not to dive underneath it. So I can't imagine why. Something about anchors, or uh, I don't know. But uh, usually it goes okay. So. That's one part of my project. The second part is, we look at this echogram and we see that thing, and I'm like, well, hey, that's a fish. I'm telling you it's a fish, and, and therefore it must be. But wouldn't it be kind of useful to know what kind of fish that is, or uh, maybe what grouping of fish that is? And uh, turns out there's a couple of ways to actually get to the bottom of this. And so part of my project is designing ways to tell what that is. So Merlot target identification would be useful. And you can do this based upon target strength. And the target strength is simply the strength of the energy that comes off of something like a fish or a single target. And you can measure that and quantify it. And uh, because it's determined by sonar frequency and the abiotic factors of the water, like temperature and salinity, we can measure those things. And one of the biggest unknowns is the physiology and the orientation of the target itself. And if we know that, then we can build a model that will predict what we might be seeing. And so this is a very scary graph. Bear with me. I, I promise it's, it's easier to understand than we think. Um, sonars operate on a kilohertz frequency. So standard sonars go anywhere from 38 kilohertz to 120 kilohertz, and that's simply the speed of the sound wave as it goes through the water column, or how many times it oscillates in a second. And you can see, let's say a fish here, it has a different backscatter response at a 38 kilohertz than it does at a 120 kilohertz. The same thing with uh, a squid. It has very, very different responses in, in lower frequencies than it does in higher frequencies. And you can use these differences, the difference between a 120 kilohertz response and a 38 kilohertz response, to say, hey, that might be a fish. You subtract one from the other, you can potentially use that as a way to identify the target. Uh, now, fish are, are pretty unique. Uh, we can build target strength models for these guys because it turns out that about 90 to 95% of their, their target strength response is because of their swim bladder. So as the compression waves goes through the fish, it hits the swim bladder, it encounters the air within the swim bladder, and that's a really big density difference. So, so sound travels a lot faster through water than it does through air. So it slows down and it sends off a really hard return. So if we know the dimensions of the fish group you know, swim bladders, we can build predictive models. 
So this is where my job gets pretty difficult. We have to go out and catch fish. And uh, so I get paid to go out and we, we catch uh, different representatives of common reef fish. This is a hogfish, uh, really, really, really tasty. Uh, jolt head corgi. Um, and I then take them to local veterinary hospitals who with a surprising lack of questioning into my qualifications and ability to use an x-ray machine, let me plop my fish down and uh, take an x-radiograph of these fish. And what we get are these x-rays. And you can very clearly see the swim bladder in relation to the fish itself. And we take both lateral and dorsal views uh, of the swim bladder. We then put this into a program and measure the morphology of the swim bladder, so the, the volume, the size, as well as this angle of incidence. So as a wave comes through the water, where does it encounter this swim bladder? Uh, if you know the angle, you can better predict uh, what it might sound like. So knowing all this from both the dorsal and the lateral views, you can build a 3D spherical model that you can, you can test if a compression wave were to hit the swim bladder at any given point, what its potential target strength return might be. So you can average these target strengths uh, for each individual fish group and build a predictive model. Uh, and so these are some of the early results that we have so far. This is a blue runner, this is a hogfish, a jolt head, a grunt, and a snapper. And you can see that they have different responses as you increase your frequency. So frequencies on the x-axis here, target strength responses on the, the, the y-axis. And what you're saying, but Adam, the, it looks like here, the hogfish and the snapper, they have a very, very similar response to 38 kilohertz. Well, so what we would do is then have two sonars deployed, one 38 kilohertz frequency, one perhaps uh, you know, 72 or 80, and we can then look at the differences between those responses, between, uh, between these, and be able to identify down to group. So the next obvious thing to do is to go to Walt Disney World, because we live in Florida and why not? But uh, we've been lucky enough that the Walt Disney World Aquarium allows us to take our equipment there and deploy it in the water. And uh, when we build these models, we need to test them. So we test them here in the aquarium. So what you see are uh, different types of transducers. This is 120 kilohertz, this little orange one. 38 kilohertz, the big one. And uh, what's known as a DIDSIN. It's an imaging sonar. And it's a bit different than the traditional sonars. And I'll show you kind of what's, uh, what that looks like in comparison to those. And what we get is we can take video, so we can identify the exact species, so we know that these are jack. We can get the length out of this imaging sonar, and so you can see the fish right here. That's all derived from sound, so it's, it's almost like a sonogram of the water column. It's really, really high frequency. You get very, very high resolution return. So we can measure the length, we know the species, and then we can also get the target strength in a traditional sonar echogram. So we can compare these things to our models and determine if the models that we've built using the swim bladder are actually able to predict what the target sounds like um, in situ in the aquarium. So is that what we see there, what we see here? Uh, to give you an idea of what the, I'm talking about when I say imaging sonar, this is a sample video. You see a, a manta ray swimming through here, and then you also get a school of fish coming through. This is all in real time very quickly is able to, to make a video, essentially, of, of these fish. It does this by stitching together 96 beams that go across it. And you can measure the width across these beams, and so you can very accurately measure the, the size of the target coming through. We actually, oh, sorry. How far down is, can that go? Uh, so this is the seven and a half meters, but uh, this, is, this particular model can go to about 25 meters. And uh, it's completely independent of light or uh, murkiness of the water. We actually use uh, a different model called the Didson here um, in the Prince William Sound to identify herring schools. So without actually removing the herring from the water, we can measure their lengths, school densities, um, and things like that. And these, these play a lot into um, the estimates of biomass and, and uh, individual counts that they get here at the, at the Science Center. So uh, we're working to integrate that, but that's a, that's a good question. The, the Didson can go to about 40 meters but you lose resolution. So you don't get as fine of a picture of the fish, but uh, you can go a little bit farther through the water. Can you ID the fish from that? Um, yes and no. So if a very distinctive fish, a uh, like hammerhead or something were to swim through it, you could very easily say, oh, well, that's, that's a hammerhead. Um, what you usually need is either some minimal amount of trawl catch or uh, a video. So usually when we deploy these, we also put videos on top of it, like GoPros. 
and uh, you can kind of confirm what you see in the area. Uh, now these guys in particular, I know that those are jack. There's a very fusiform shape, they're, they're very distinctive. Um, I, can, I can tell what those are. So it just depends on your, your prior knowledge of the system and kind of what you expect you might see. And then uh, you can also uh, uh, kind of make assumptions. So, so in conclusion, um, what I'll be doing when I finish this project is basically building a data set where one has not existed before. Uh, so the nectonic biomass distributions in Miami-Dade County are not very well described. Hopefully we can you know, inform management decisions and uh, policies to better preserve these already overfished populations. Uh, we're also going to have direct comparisons between the diver and the acoustic surveys. And hopefully, and this is what's going to take a little bit of time, is to compare the results of these two different types of surveys and to see if they show the same patterns. Um, in abundances and distributions, or if they show different patterns, and how we can kind of combine those. If we can have one or two diver surveys, and then expand upon them with a couple kilometers of acoustic surveys, we could very, very quickly monitor these reefs um, in some sort of rapid ecosystem assessment tool, uh, whereas we didn't have that capability before. Uh, the logistics behind diving over large areas gets uh, very problematic once you start to cover large areas. And we're also going to have a novel radiograph database of these common local reef fish. So the reef fish that we're catching and taking x-rays of, uh, we're going to have the ability to take these x-rays and build these models. And this is going to allow us to say, hey, this school of fish that we see here, that's probably some sort of grunt. That's probably some sort of snapper. And we can uh, hopefully get more site-specific with, with this identification uh, as we go. So in the future, I only have 29 direct comparisons so far between the divers uh, and the acoustics, so I need to get about 60, I think, before we can really start uh, examining any kind of uh, direct comparisons between the two. And uh, I need to analyze my data to kind of tease out any, any relationships between these, these survey methods, and in particular, the reef characteristics. So my divers, when they conduct these surveys, are collecting information such as the depth of the water, um, the complexity of the reef structure. So generally, when you have increased reef complexity, you have an increased uh, abundance of fish uh, and higher densities. So I'd like to know which of these are more important to, uh, in terms of describing where these, these fish are found, where these, uh, these communities stay. And I also need to keep fishing. So uh, it turns out I'm not a very good fisherman from a boat. I, uh, I've recently got permission to take a gill net down, and basically it means I scuba dive a lot and chase fish into this gill net and uh, take them up to the top. So I need to do some more fishing. I need to get back to Disney a couple more times and get uh, some more target strength estimates of known fish of known sizes. And uh, finally, I need to see if I can apply these to our field data and uh, if all of this work is really going to pan out, which uh, so far our, our preliminary stuff shows that uh, we, can, we can get a pretty decent discrimination. So I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Kevin Boswell, uh, my committee, as well as the veterinary nets um, at uh, Walt Disney World. Uh, the Finding Nemo Living Seas Aquarium, uh, Drs. Joe Barbosa and Albert Williams for not investigating my background history anymore. I said, what, when they asked what I needed to do these x-rays for, I said, for science, and the carte blanche allowed me access to uh, their x-rays. So very thankful for that, uh, as well as all of our other sponsors. Um, for science! For science, <laughs> yeah. And people are okay with it. It's really, it's really incredible. Uh, yeah. So does anyone have any questions? Not having time to that, I ran, the, I ran through that pretty quick. You were at 20 when you said the conclusions. Oh, okay. Well, um, I mean, I've dove a lot on reefs, mm -hmm. and uh, an awful lot of the fish like hide all the time. You know, yes. And the eels and all this stuff. I mean, they're not out swimming around, and then the ones that are swimming around really hug close to the actual coral. I'm talking about Hawaii now. Oh, yeah, and so a lot of the fish species are... Um, very closely related to, to the ones in Hawaii. They're, they're pretty similar, at so least in behavior. I, I, I believe it. And yeah. So how do you count? I mean, do you have any chance at all of acoustically uh, counting them at all? Or? Well, and, and that's the idea, actually, yeah. So when, as a diver, when you're there, just by being there, you're influencing their behavior. So when you see them hugging the corals and hiding in these oh, places, it's yeah. because they're hiding from you. And so the idea is that if we know kind of what's there, so if we get a diver that says, well, before we saw grunts here, and we saw parrotfish, and then we have an acoustic survey, we see them off of the bottom. Okay. In their kind of natural... I guess behavior. that was my question. Yeah. Is, uh, 
And, uh, yes, and that's one of the biases and that's one of the problems with these diver surveys is that, you know, just by being there, you're changing how they're, they're behaving. Uh, so we hope we can account for that with the acoustics. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. Can you see fish that are very close to the bottom? Um, in the acoustics? Yeah. We can discriminate uh, depending on our frequency and our pulse duration, anywhere from two and a half centimeters to um, uh, four, four or five centimeters off of the bottom. Do you have species like flounders and stuff like that there? For, like, the I don't think it's realistic to think we can ever really survey flounder. Um, I can, I kind of think that that's okay though because divers also have a very difficult time seeing the flounder. They're generally not reef associated. They're more of a. Um, oh no, I just meant something similar to that. Oh, you mean something that hangs around in the benthos yeah. kind of a lot? Uh, yeah. So a lot of the wrasses and, and things like that. Um, we're relatively small fish that, that hang out in the crevices even when you're not there, you know, so you leave videos behind and, and the, their behavior is generally bottom associated. Um, we're not really accounting too much for those, mostly because they make up um, a small proportion of the overall biomass of that reef. Um, and while they still might ecologically be important in terms of managing for recreational uses and, and commercial fisheries, they're not really of interest because people don't catch them, you know, people don't target those and that kind of thing. And so we really don't consider those in, in our surveys. Uh, what's your data saying for your model verification? How long are these things matching up? Uh, so the preliminary stuff, we've really, I've really only had time to look at uh, just a couple of them, but um, we're within a couple decibels uh, of return, which is generally pretty close. Um, we're seeing a high amount of variability in our models that we're building, pretty wide range of of possible, possible responses. And I think that's more of a factor that we don't have a lot of x-rays yet. Um, so the more x-rays we get, the more the more of a length distribution we get, we'll be able to refine the model more. And so as we catch these fish, we're also accounting for, you know, as their length changes, their swim bladder is also going to change. So when I get a more representative sample uh, sub-size for each, each fish and each grouping, uh, we'll see, uh, hopefully, the, the accuracy of those improve. And I think we will also be more data. Well, thanks for presenting your, your research. Yeah. It's awesome. Thank you guys very much for your time. I appreciate yeah. you all coming out. <laughs>